Chapter 13 At that time of the year it was not very difficult to escape from a village. I often watched the boys attach homemade skates to their shoes and spread pieces of canvas over the heads and let the wind push them over the smooth surface of the ice, covering the marshes and the pastures. The marshes spread over many miles between the villages. In the autumn, the waters rose, submerging the reeds and the bushes. Small fish and other creatures multiplied rapidly in the bogs. One could sometimes see a snake, its head raised stiffly, swimming with determination. The marshes did not freeze as quickly as the local ponds and lakes. It was as though the winds and reeds were defending themselves by agitating the water. In the end, however, ice gripped everything. Only the tips of tall reeds, an odd twig or two, protruded here and there, covered by a frosty coating on which snowflakes perched precariously. The winds came wild and unharnessed. The they bypassed human settlements and gained speed over flat marshlands, swirling with them clouds of powdery snow, pushing along old branches and dry potato stalks, bending the proud heads of taller trees jutting through the ice. I knew there was many different winds, and that they fr fought battles, butting each other, wrestling, trying to win more ground. I had already made a pair of skates, knowing that some day I would have to leave the village. I attached some thick wire to a long piece of wood, curved at one end. Then I threaded straps to the skates, and attached them firmly to the boots, which I myself also made. The boots consisted of a wooden rectangular shoes and scrapes of rabbit skins, reinforced on the outside with canvas. I fixed the skates to my boots at the edge of the marshlands. I hung the burning comet over my shoulder and spread a sail over my head. The invisible hand of the wind began to push me. I gathered speed with every gust that blew me away from the village. My skates glided over the ice, and I felt the warmth of the comet. I was now in the middle of the vast icy surface. The howling wind drove me along. The dark gray clouds with light edges raced across me on my journey. Flying along the endless white plain, I felt free and alone, like a starling soaring in the air, tossed by every flurry, follow, following a stream, unconscious of his speed, drawn into an abandoned dance. Trusting myself to the power of the wind, I spread my sail even wider. It was hard to believe that the local people regard the wind as an enemy and closed their windows to it, afraid that it might bring them plague, perilous, and death. They always said that the devil was the master of the winds which carried out his evil orders. The icy air was now pushing me in a steady thrust. I flew over the ice, dodged the occasional frozen stalks. The sun was dim, and when I finally stopped, my shoulder and ankles were stiff and cold. I decided to rest and warm myself, but when I reached for my comet, I found that it had blown out. Not a spark remained. I sagged with fear, not knowing what to do. I could not return to the village, did not have the strength for the long struggle against the wind. I had no idea whether there was any farms in the vicinity whether I could find them before nightfall, and whether they would give me shelter even if I found them. I heard something that sounded like a chuckle in the whistling wind. I shivered at the thought that the devil himself was testing me by le leading me around in circles, waiting for the moment when I could would accept his offer. As the wind whipped me, I could hear other whispers, muttering and moans. The evil ones were interested in me at last. To train me in hatred, they had first separated me from my parents, then had taken away Marta and Olga, delivered me to the hands of the carpenter, robbed me of my speech, then given Uka to the he-goat, now they dragged me through the frozen wilderness, threw snow in my face, turned my thoughts into confusion. I was in their power, alone in the grassy sheet of ice which the evil ones themselves had spread between distant villages. They turned somersaults over my head and could send me anywhere on, at their whim. I started walking on my aching feet, oblivious of time. Every step was painful and I had to rest at frequent intervals. 
I sat on the ice trying to move my freezing legs, rubbing my cheeks, nose, and ears with snow scraped off of my hair and clothes, massaged my rigid fingers trying to find some feeling in my numb toes. The sun was down to the horizon and the slanting rays were as cold as the moon's. When I sat down, the world around me looked like a vast skillet, carefully polished by an industrious housewife. I stretched the canvas over my head, trying to catch every turbulence as I moved straight ahead towards the setting sun. When I had almost given up hope, I noticed the distant outlines of thatched roofs. A few moments later, when the village was clearly visible, I saw a gang of boys approaching me on, on skates. Without my comment, I was afraid of them and tried to cut away at an angle, aiming at the outskirts of the settlement but it was too late. They had already noticed me. The group headed my direction. I started running against the wind, but I was out of breath and could hardly stand on my legs. I sat on the ice, grasping the handle of the comet. The boys came closer. There was ten or more, swinging their arms, supporting one another. They progressed steadily against the wind. The air threw their voices back. I could hear nothing. When they were quite close, they split into two gro groups and approached me cautiously. I huddled on the ice and covered my face with a canvas sail, hoping they might leave me alone. They encircled me with suspicion. I pretended not to notice them. <clears throat> Three of the strongest came closer. A gypsy said, a gypsy once said, a gypsy bastard. The others stood by calmly. But when I tried to get up, they jumped on me and twisted my arms behind my back. The group became excited. They beat me on the face and the stomach. Blood froze on my lips and closed one eye. The tallest one said something. The others seemed to agree enthusiastically. Some held me by the legs. Others started pulling off my pants. I knew what they wanted to do. I had seen a band of shepherds raping a boy from another village who happened to wander into their territory. I knew that, that only something unforeseen could save me. I allowed them to take, my, take off my pants, pretending I was exhausted and could not fight anymore. I guessed that they would take off my boots and skates because they were too firmly attached to my feet. Noticing that I was lip, limp and did not resist, they relaxed their grip. Two of the biggest crouched by my bare abdomen and struck me with frozen gloves. I tensed my muscle, withdrew one leg slightly, and kicked one of the boys, bending over me. Something cracked in his head. At first I thought it was the skate, but, the whole, but it was whole when I jerked it out of the boy's eye. Another one tried to grab me by the legs. I kicked him across the throat with a skate. The two boys fell on the ice, bleeding profusely. The rest of the boys panicked. Most of them started dragging the wounded boys towards the village, leaving a bloody trail on the ice. Four stayed behind. These pinned me down with a long pole used for fishing in ice holes. When I ceased struggling, they dragged me towards a nearby hole. I resisted desperately at the edge of the water, but they were ready. Two of them widened the hole, and then they all heaved together, pushing me under the ice with the pointed end of the pole. They tried to make sure that I could not emerge. The icy water shut over me. I closed my mouth and held my breath, feeling the painful thrust of the spike pushing, un pushing me under. I slid underneath the ice, and it rubbed, my, it rubbed my head, my shoulders, and my bare hands, and then the pointed pole was bobbing at my fingertips, no longer being jabbed into me, for the boys had let go of it. The cold encased me. My mind was freezing. I was sliding down, choking. The water here was shallow, and my only thought was, was that I could use the pole to push against the bottom and lift myself to the ice cut. I grabbed the pole and it supported me as I moved along underneath the surface of the ice. My lungs were nearly bursting. I was ready to open my mouth and swallow anything. I found myself near the ice cut. With one more push, my head popped out, and I gulped air that felt like a stream of boiling soup. I caught the sharp edge of the ice, 
holding on to it such a way as to be able to breathe without emerging too often. I did not know how far the boys had gone, and I preferred to wait a while. Only my face was still alive. The rest of my body was quite dead. I could not feel it at all. It seemed to be a part of the surrounding ice. I made efforts to move my legs and feet. I peered cautiously over the edge of the ice and saw the boys disappearing into the distance, and diminishing with every step they took. When they were far enough away, I climbed to the surface. My clothes immediately froze solid and cracked at every movement. I jumped up and down to stretch my stiff legs and arms and rub myself with snow, but warmth returned only for a few seconds and then vanished again. I tied the ragged remains of my pants to my legs and then pulled the pole out of the ice, ice hole and leaned heavily on it. The wind struck me sideways. I had trouble keeping my direction. Whenever I weakened, I pulled the pole between my legs and pushed on it, as though riding on a stiff tail. I was slowly moving away from the huts, towards a forest visible in the distance. It was very late afternoon, and the brownish di disk of the sun was cut by square shapes of roofs and chimneys. Every gust of wind robbed my body of precious remnants of warmth. I knew that I must not rest or stop even for a moment until I reached the forest. I began to see patterns of bark in the trees. A frightened hare jumped from under a bush. When I reached the first trees, my head was spinning. It seemed to be midsummer, and the golden ears of wheat were wa waving over my head, and Uka touched me with her warm hand. I had visions of food, a huge bowl of beef seasoned with vinegar, garlic, pepper, and salt, a pot of coarse gruel, thickened with pickled cabbage leaves and pieces of succulent fat bacon, evenly cut slices of barley bread soaked in thick borscht of barley, potatoes, and corn. I took another few steps over the frozen ground and entered the forest. My skates caught on roofs and bushes. I stumbled once and then sat on the tree trunk. Almost immediately I started to sink into a hot bed full of soft, smooth, warm pillows and elder downs. Someone leaned over me. I heard a woman's voice. I was being carried somewhere. Everything dissolved into a sultry summer night full of intoxicating, moist, fragrant mist.